Good evening guys, it's quarter past nine. I'm just about to leave for work. I'm doing a night shift. It's my first night shift of a set of four. So I thought I could take you along with me. Yeah, so I'm working lots of nights at the moment. Lots of you have been messaging me on Instagram asking why I'm on nights yet again. Well, as you know, if you've been watching this channel for a while, I'm a locum doctor. And what locum doctors do is mostly pick and choose their own shifts. And in the emergency department where I work, the night shifts pay the best. And we are trying to save for the deposit for this house. Um, so, you know, at the moment, I'm really trying to maximize my earnings and just try and bring in the bacon as much as I can. So I am working pretty much all night shifts. Um, and to be honest, I'm really enjoying it. I had a day shift not that long ago and I was like, whoa, I just, it didn't feel right. I, was, I had to set my alarm for 5 a.m. I was like, 5 a.m., this is when I'm normally like finishing my break on a night shift. It felt very, very weird. So yeah, I'm gonna stick with the night shifts until we get the property and then, um, I am gonna drop my hours down at work, drop my A&E hours down and start work more on the business that I'm trying to grow aside from this YouTube channel. Um, I'm setting up an aesthetics clinic, so Botox and fillers. Again, it's not really something I've spoken a lot about on this channel, but it is something I've got going on in the background. Um, and yeah, just trying to like grow this YouTube channel. Uh, a lot of you have signed up to my newsletter so that you can keep in touch with me a bit more. I have big plans. And yeah, I'm just trying to kind of hustle it away in the background. And, and that is why I love being a locum because I get the opportunity to pick and choose my shifts so that I can focus on business stuff when I'm not at work. So if any of you are interested in me talking a little bit more about that and hearing what I have to, you know, what I'm up to outside of work, then feel free to drop me a message in the comments below if I get enough, um, people saying that they want to hear more about that then I will of course make a video and let you guys know what it is that I'm up to and like how locum shifts work how I manage my time and my money and that kind of thing um, you know I love talking about that kind of stuff at 10 to 10 I've just arrived at work I'm gonna go in we have a meeting at the start of the shift where we get told by the consultant where we're gonna be working so whether that's COVID non-COVID recess majors minors um, you don't really get a choice in it there's you know if you can't work in the covid unit because you have a health condition or someone in your uh, household has a health condition or the mask that we have to be fitted for doesn't fit you correctly then you can say i can't work in the covid unit um but otherwise you kind of just get put wherever you're wherever you're put but we shall see where i am tonight <laughs> hours into my shift and I sneak out the back to have a snack and a drink and then a couple of hours later it's time for my break. So it's five in the morning now um, as you can see it's actually light outside I'm just on my break. Um, it's been really really busy I'm in majors tonight I'm on my own in my team majors is split into three teams and it's been really busy which is why I'm only just getting my break. To be honest I really don't mind the shift goes really quickly when it's busy and it has been quite interesting. I'll tell you all about it when I finish. There's no better feeling than finishing a night shift coming outside to the beautiful blue sky and seeing everyone else on their way into work. My goodness, it's bright this morning. It's very hard to adjust to the daylight when you come out for a night shift. I feel like a sort of vampire. I'm like, oh, it's so bright. Okay, so it's about half past eight in the morning now. My shift finished at, well, it was meant to finish at eight, but I ended up finishing late because I had a few loose ends to tie off that I didn't really want to hand over because there's certain things that you hand over and there's certain things that are just etiquette to just sort out yourself when you know your patients and it's actually quicker for you to sort that problem than it is 
to hand it over to the other doctor who will then have to read through all the notes and kind of get the backstory. Um, so yeah, I stayed behind to do those jobs. So I thought I'd just sit down in the car at the end of my shift and tell you all about it now. So what patients did I see? So I was in majors. I saw lots of patients. Um, and when the twilight doctors finished, so at midnight and 2 a.m., we I got the handovers for all of their patients as well. So I was seeing new patients and taking the handovers from patients from doctors that were leaving um, and kind of chasing the scans and you know following up the things that their patients needed before either admitting them or sending them home and last night we seem to have a bit of a theme this just happens sometimes in a and &E, and I don't really know why it happens but you sometimes weirdly have a theme of the night where you see like similar things cropping up again and again last night the themes were overdoses and headaches. I saw quite a few overdoses, lots of mental health problems coming into the emergency department at the moment. I don't know if it's linked to COVID and the fact that lots of people are losing their jobs, lots of people are stuck at home, lots of people are really struggling for money um, and all the kind of social things that go alongside COVID. I don't actually know the um, statistics around it and I'm not sure that we will know until afterwards. Um, headaches. So, saw so a couple of interesting people with headaches. I'll talk you through it and see if you can, if you're a medical student, maybe you'll be able to work out what is wrong with this patient from the history that I'm giving or what we think is wrong with the patient. So, the patient came in with the worst headache of their life. They felt very lightheaded at the time, dizzy, collapsed to the ground, didn't lose consciousness, started feeling really, really nauseous and vomiting um, and didn't like bright lights, so photophobic. They got rushed into hospital, had a full workup, so ECG, bloods, the usual things we would do when someone comes into hospital. We also did a CT scan of the head. Now the CT scan came back as negative, so any medical students out there, um, I want you to pause this video and think about what you would do next this is a classic um, medical school question what would you do next like, well firstly what is the diagnosis that we're thinking of what's the top differential for this patient and secondly what was what would be next after the CT head is negative um, this is something that trips up a lot of people so the diagnosis that you're thinking of well that we were thinking of and that it should come to mind with this patient is a subarachnoid hemorrhage a subarachnoid hemorrhage is classically first and worst we call it a thunderclap headache so a, a headache that is that comes on maximal intensity within seconds and you may have some neurological findings as well um so this patient had dizziness and um photophobia so those are quite classic symptoms actually when i was on um neurosurgery i don't know if you you may have watched some of my neurosurgery vlog neurosurgery vlogs so a lot of subarachnoid hemorrhage so this patient had those classic signs and symptoms now Subarachnoid hemorrhages don't actually always show up on CT scans and so if you're an inexperienced doctor or um, you forget the guidelines you may be tempted to send this patient home and say it was a migraine or it was something else um, and you don't know you, it, was, it was just a headache. However if the CT head comes back as negative, you must not send that patient home. They must be admitted for a lumbar puncture. So this patient got sent to the medical ward to go and have a lumbar puncture. If that comes back as negative, then they can go home and we can tell them that it was nothing. But if it shows that they've had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, then they will need to come in and stay in for treatment in the neurosurgery department. Go and have a read if you're interested in that. And the thing that I like about A&E is that you never know, because you never know what's going to be walking through the door, you don't know what patients and what signs and symptoms symptoms they were, they're going to have, you really need to be thorough. And I really like that all of those things that you learn in medical school are brought together um, and you're actually getting to use those clinical skills that you get taught, those like first basic principles. So yeah, I really enjoy that. It's kind of like a diagnostic challenge. Another classic thing that we see in A&E, and I saw a couple of last night, are elderly patients with falls. And a lot of the time you get elderly patients who are confused, and you don't know whether they are always confused, whether they've got dementia, 
Um, or are they confused because they've banged their head and they've now got an intracranial bleed causing them to have some confusion. So it's really important to get a good collateral history. So collateral history is a history from someone that knows that patient well. Um, and at the moment with COVID, we're not allowing any visitors to come to the hospital with patients. So you get this confused patient, confused elderly patient, they're on their own, they've been brought in by an ambulance and you just don't really know anything about them. You might have some second or third hand information from the ambulance crew, but it can be quite difficult to work out what is going on. You want to ask the patient some questions, but they're not going to be able to give you history. They might not actually remember much, but you can ask them about what their what their current situation is. Are you in pain? Do you feel short of breath? Do you feel like you need to cough? And then actually examining them as you would normally. But history wise, it's really important to um, get a collateral history. So I've spent a lot of time phoning up relatives, phoning up care homes, finding out how is this patient normally? Um, you know, can, does she normally know where she is? What can she normally do for herself? And asking all of those sort of basic questions. So you've got an idea of their baseline. And then obviously doing a top to toe examination, looking for other injuries. And then with falls, one of the important things is to think about why did they fall? Have they had a heart attack that's made them fall? Are they having an arrhythmia that's caused them to fall? Are they septic? Do they have an infection? Do they have ill-fitting footwear? Has their vision gone funny and that's caused them to fall? Have they had a stroke and that's caused them to fall? So yeah, you do loads and loads of investigations that help you work out why this person has fallen. Have they got any injuries from the fall? And then working out if they are safe to go home or if they need to come into hospital. I quite like seeing those patients because, again, it is like you're kind of piecing together bits of the puzzle. And I quite like working out what's going on. And I did a healthcare of the elderly job. I loved that job. And I try and take the principles that I learned from that job um, into A&E. And another couple of cases. This is going to end up being another long video. I just know it. But hopefully you guys find these cases interesting. And if you do please give this video a thumbs up uh, to let me know that you enjoy it and leave me a comment down below to let me know that you want me to talk about cases because otherwise I am literally just sitting in my car talking to myself <laughs> for no reason. Uh, another couple of cases that I saw that are similar but very different are two patients approximately the same age have both come in with left flank pain. Flank is like the area of the middle of your back to one side and two patients have come in with exactly the same pain but quite different diagnosis and when we are thinking about pain and when we think about symptoms it, we often go back to the anatomy that you learn in medical school when we're examining patients we think about what is actually there what what organs are in that area that is causing this patient pain so the first patient had pain that was First of all, it was like suprapubic pain, so pain at the lower middle part of the tummy, and then that pain travelled up um, to the middle part of his back to one side. He was feeling hot and sweaty, he was nauseous, he was vomiting, and so with this kind of history, there's a lot of things that you, that you can think about, but the main thing is a bladder infection that could be traveling up to his kidney, which is called pyelonephritis. But we treated him for sepsis. Yeah. He'd had a positive urine dip from his GP a couple of days before, showing that he did have an infection. He had been given some antibiotics by the GP, but because he was vomiting, he was actually vomiting those tablets up, so wasn't able to reap the benefits of the antibiotics, therefore went downhill, the infection spread to his kidney, and he's ended up in A&E. The other patient who came in with some pain in the same area is actually slightly different. So the pain started in that area and it went down towards the bladder. So kind of a different morphology of the pain. With this type of pain, classically, these patients don't want to stay still. Anytime the pain comes on, they want to, they're writhing around trying to find any position that they can to get comfortable in. And the other thing that's classic of this type of pain is that it comes and goes. And we describe that kind of pain as colicky when it comes and goes. So just to summarise and see if any of you can work out what's wrong with him. So in terms of the history, he had 
loin to groin pain is what we call it so pain in one side going down into the lower part of his tummy some pink colored urine so a bit of blood in his urine the pain comes and goes so it's colicky in nature and it's really really severe when it is bad and he can't sit still he can't get comfortable when the pain comes on he's not got a fever he's not got any other symptoms that would suggest he's got an infection um, he's not got any other pains anywhere else in his tummy and he doesn't have any medical conditions. Blood tests were all normal. Urine dip showed blood. My top differential diagnosis was that he had a renal stone. And the reason that you get blood is because it causes a bit of damage to the ureter and you get blood into your urine. So what we do for these patients is send them for a CT scan of their kidneys and then sure enough that showed that he had a stone in the kidney. He's got some good pain relief on board and he's going to come back and be seen by the urologists to sort that stone out. Quite interesting to see kind of two people coming in with very similar symptoms but actually got two quite different problems and need to be treated in quite different ways. So guys that is the end of this video, that's the end of my shift, it's the end of these cases. I have got quite a few more that I could have shared with you but this lady is tired and needs to go to bed. I don't know why I'm wearing like a winter coat in July. Uh, it tends to be quite cool when I'm going to my shifts and then coming back out. And right now the sun is blazing and uh, I feel like an absolute idiot wearing like a furry coat while other, other people are walking around in shorts and t-shirt. So anyway, I'm going to get myself home, get myself into bed, get my eye mask on, my earplugs in and settle down for a good day's sleep. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Give it a thumbs up if you have and make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell notification button if you want to see when I get when every time I upload a video. Also, I've got a newsletter um, and I put the link down in the description box below. I'm going to be sending out lots of goodies straight to your inbox. So if you want to be part of that, then click on the link down below and you can get involved there. I'll see you next time, guys. Bye. This week's shout out goes to Katie Tompkins who commented on my last video which was a video all about an unusual route into medical school and Katie commented thank you both for this video Sarah your quote about how we don't just get one chance we get whatever it is we make of the opportunities we have really resonated with me given the extra push to get my head down for the next two months of GAMSAT hell thank you both oh my goodness Katie totally feel your pain about the GAMSAT just keep going girl it will be so worth it and guys if you take away something from this video and I hope you spend a bit of time mulling this over you do not just get one chance you get whatever opportunities you make so don't feel like whatever you're doing right now has to be the be all and end all of everything I love you all loads and I'll catch you in the next video